Hello, and welcome to the Effects Corner. I'm your host, Scott Squires, and I'll be discussing the art and technique of visual effects. As always, if you'd like to make a comment or suggestion, you can visit the website at effectscorner.blogspot.com. I'll be showing a commercial I directed and did the effects for. The effects are relatively simple, but I thought it would be good to run through some of the issues, even on a simple spot. So here's the commercial itself. Every project starts with a script or storyboards. In this case, I've done some very simple thumbnails to get the idea across to the rest of the crew. The nice thing about the cartoon style is I can Xerox it as many times as I want, as well as make very small reproductions, just as a quick reference. Now the first task with any project is to take a look at both the creative and technical requirements. How much time is available for pre-production, for the actual production itself, and how much time is available for post-production? What type of budget is it? What format? All of these types of things will go into determining what, what the uh, correct type of technique uh, to use on this particular project would be. On any given project, it's usually not a matter of determining how to do an effect, but figuring out which technique is best to use. This applies not only to each shot, but each element within the shot as well. There are times where a complex shot may require special computer graphics usage, but most of the time you have the option about which technique you should use, each with their pros and cons. As an effects supervisor, it's important to be well versed in many techniques as possible. If you only know one technique, you're likely to try to use that for everything even though it may not be the best uh, application for it for a specific shot or project. Now each effect supervisor approaches the shots in a different way and they may come up with a totally different approach uh, to those shots. It's possible you can end up with totally different techniques for each and every shot in a show or commercial, but when possible it's good to try to keep to the same consistent technique, or at least to minimize the number of techniques. The advantage here is it helps to keep the budget down. You avoid things about duplicating work, such as duplicating both a CG model of the object along with the physical model of it. Uh, the other advantage of the same technique is the luck will remain the same throughout. It also helps the crew because they can then focus on this one process and get it worked out. So you want to base the technique not just on the one shot, but on uh, the big picture. You know, wh what makes the most sense. And in some cases, you're going to have to use different techniques. And in other cases, when possible, you try to use a similar technique throughout. Now this particular commercial, uh, some of the parameters for it were a half a shoot day on location, a limited budget, locked off camera, and hero pants will be shot on 35 millimeter film and finished in video. So one of the approaches to take with this might be a CG approach. And when I talk about computer graphics, I'm specifically referring to 3D aspects. Virtually all compositing these days is done digitally. Now let's take a look at how CG would work on this particular spot. A pair of pants would require to be modeled and painted to match the real pants. The modeling would have to also take into account the cloth dynamic simulation, as well as the rendering of the cloth. Shadows would be rendered to match the surface of the street or sidewalk. Now, once the pants have been modeled and painted, they ne now need to be animated. And of course, this needs to be as realistic as possible for the motion. So I would tend to go ahead and shoot a reference pass of a real actor on the location walking or at least videotape some actor walking so that we can have something for the animator to reference off of. 
would also be possible to do an animation roto where we shot somebody walking in the scene and the animator could overlay his uh, pants with that and actually move the animated pants or the CG pants along with that image or at least use that as a starting point. The other uh, possible um, way to animate on this particular project would be as motion capture. Have somebody wearing this special motion capture costume and record their motions and then apply that to the CG pants. Some of the big advantages of the CG process for something like this is the complete freedom of motion. The pants could be folded up on the shelf, jump down, unfold, and start to walk. They could flap the legs and start to fly through the air like a bird or change shape into another object. The camera is free to move anywhere if you're doing match moving. The camera could in fact fly down one of the insides of a pant leg. Since this is a post-production process, it also means that we have complete control over placement and timing. And so if the client wanted to make very specific changes or choices, we could do that after the fact, after the shooting was done. The downside of using CG on the spot would be any client or of a product is very leery about a representation of their product, whether it's a physical model or a CG model. Uh, for a number of years, uh, commercial producers and clients didn't want to use computer graphic cars because they wanted to make sure it was exactly like the real car. And even in today's age, uh, most of them, you know, want to double check anything that goes out as their product. One of the other problems with using CG is the amount of time and money spent modeling the pants. Uh, the animation, of course, you're mimicking a real object moving around in this case, so it makes that difficult and that will need to be accurate for, once again, the client and everyone else to buy off on. You're also going to be spending a fair amount of time dealing with cloth folding issues in the computer graphics side of the world uh, because there's all kinds of little nuances and much depends on the specific software that you're using to create that. And in the end, the, all the, for all the potential freedom of motion that the computer graphics would offer us and the changing of the shape and all of that, none of that is actually required for this spot. Uh, we're not using elaborate camera moves, and we don't need the pants to change shape or go through a lot of metamorphosis type of changes. Now another approach is the opposite end of the spectrum, and that would be the physical effects approach. And in this case, the pants would be puppeteered on the location. Now most practical effects people are used to doing explosions and fires and things like that. And in this case, it would require somebody within the uh, normal practical effects type of person, but somebody who's more versed and very controlled and puppeteering type of methodology, which not all special effects people do. So it's important to find the right person for this who could also lay out a detailed game plan. Now, puppeteering cloth and, and moving clothing isn't a new thing that's been around for quite a while. A uh, good reference for this is something like Bed Knobs and Broomsticks movie uh, put out by Disney years ago. The pants could be full-size pants rigged with a lightweight frame and with joints. And then it's possible that you could construct a platform overhead and essentially have the puppeteer walking along with the pants and moving them up and down in a realistic manner. It might also be possible for them to rig a frame on, on the actor up above that would be connected to the pants suspended down below. This way you'd automatically get realistic type of motion. Uh, and the, the thing here is that you're seeing everything live. So the client and the production company, everybody's seeing it as it's appearing, as it will finally appear in the real uh, commercial with the exception of the wires or rods sticking down and those would be relatively easy to remove in post-production. Now an alternative with the same type of puppeteering approach would be to have a puppeteer walking alongside or behind the pants. In this case the pants would be directly attached to them and they'd be walking and using rods or other types of things to manipulate them. This was in fact the same process that they used for C-3PO in Star Wars The Phantom Menace. C-3PO on that movie 
had no shell around him, no skin. So you saw through large parts of uh, the robot in that case. And then, so they had a man dressed in a green costume, and that's probably what you'd be looking at here, is a green screen type of costume for the puppeteer, since they're actually in the scene. And they attached C-3PO to him, so as he moved around, C-3PO moved. And then in post-production, through rotoscoping and green screen, they removed the puppeteer from those scenes. Now, the downside with the uh, practical effects and puppeteering approach, would it, would be the amount of time required to pre-rig the system and the number of takes potentially required to get the puppeteering exactly right, especially if it's not directly connected to a person. Uh, and if you have any changes on the location, this could be very time-consuming. So time would be a major limitation of this, uh, just because of the complexity of trying to puppeteer, the number of takes involved. And the other potential limitation with this would be the flexibility. If the client decided partway through they wanted the pants to turn around or do something not planned on, uh, that would be a very time-consuming process for them to re-rig and reset for that. Now, a variation on the puppeteering would be to do the puppeteering in front of a green screen. So you would shoot your original live-action plate with just the main actor with, without the pants, and then we'll shoot the pants against a green screen using puppeteers as well to move it around. And the puppeteers could either use a wire rigs or they could also be dressed in green screen outfits and move the, the pants around. Uh, now the downside here is that uh, even though you have a smaller stage crew, you will have an impact on the budget and schedule because you have an additional stage day that you wouldn't have if you were able to do it all on lo location. The other issue, of course, with any kind of green screen or blue screen, you have to match the lighting to the background. And a bright sunny day isn't the easiest thing to match to. You also have to make sure that you've got the shadows cast onto the ground so that you can try to use those if at all possible. Now, of course, a variation on any kind of puppeteering would be stop-motion animation. It would be possible to make miniature pants and stop-motion animate those, but that uh, achieves a certain look or a certain style that would not necessarily work for this particular project. Non-puppeting. As long as we're talking about stage work, we could shoot someone in the pants in front of a green screen. Go ahead and shoot the live action first on the location, and then the pants would be shot at a later date or the next day on a green screen. The person wearing the pants would be dressed completely in a green screen suit to allow his removal. This would create the natural motion of the uh, real pants, now the downside is it's still an extra day of stage photography and as discussed before the matching complexities of the lighting and camera. Uh, the hard daylight shadowing will create some difficulties when creating the mat from a, even a green screen costume. Now let's take a look at using the same procedure, the same basic concept, but shooting it on location. The person wearing the pants could walk in the scene with the other actor. So now you have an interaction between the two characters that would come naturally without having to wor worry about timing issues. You'd also have the real pants moving in a realistic manner. Since this is shot at the same time and same place, all the lighting matches exactly. It fits into the scene well. Uh, there's uh, very little matting processes involved in this case. And it would be possible to do multiple takes with different timings or different uh, actions and uh, without using a lot of time. So there are certainly some advantages to doing it on location with somebody dressed up. Now the downside is we have to make sure we shot clean plates for the scene since we need to remove the person in the pants. And a good clean plate is going to require a non-moving background and lighting. Shadows from the the actor onto the ground will have to be removed as well, so we end up with just the shadows of the pants themselves. Of all the options to consider, this last methodology is the one I chose for this particular commercial. It's relatively easy in live action and post. There wasn't a big time penalty when shooting, because we had to shoot the whole spot in less than a half a day. 
and there wasn't a big budget impact of using, creating models or doing special rigging. And the same technique can also be applied to removing the pants of the other actor. If any of the requirements of the shots or production changed, one of the other techniques discussed might be a better choice. For the actual shoot, I decided to not go with the green screen costumes, and I'll discuss that a little bit in a moment. But the, one of the main problems is just, as I said before, just trying to pull a good key off of it. So I just opted to go with the rotoscope process uh, to achieve the same result since I knew I'd have to be doing a certain amount of rotoscoping anyway. It was just simple. I hope you've uh, learned a few things from this podcast. And thanks again for listening, or in this case, watching the Effects Corner podcast. Thank you. <laughs>